Well, first of all, uh, so good to be with you this morning. It's a real joy and a pleasure uh, to actually come to speak to you on a Sunday, been many times on a Thursday and uh, in other occasions also. Uh, greetings from the church there in Narbeth. And we are indebted to you here at Libanus on so many accounts. Uh, John has preached for us on a number of occasions before. Well, Sam, I've lost count too many times. Sam has been down there. And of course, Neville has been with us over the years. So when we come to uh, Sunday uh, services uh, during the year, we've had a number of you uh, from Libanus and we've been blessed indeed. And uh, this, this opportunity then to come and share God's word with you. Now, I know that uh, our reading was taken from Mark chapter 16. It's a practice that we do have, our little practice, that uh, when we have Easter Sunday, we actually have a theme of Easter Sundays uh, for the next number of weeks. I always think it's a really good thing to have a resurrection hymn uh, on a Sunday morning. It's the day our Lord rose again from the dead, and that would be our theme for about six weeks. And now you have got now that theme again uh, this morning. Look, it's a wonderful message. You think of the news we've got to bring that Christ has conquered death. There is hope that he has come to give to this world. Look, many people do not know of it. There are those who have heard of it, and yet they are unbelieving. They believe it's a myth. They believe it's a tale. It's got something nice to say. There are others, perhaps even here this morning, which do believe it. You believe that Christ has risen from the dead, but the significance and the implications, perhaps uh, you have not experienced so much in your life. You've been at the graveside. It's given you some hope. Death has been conquered. The grave is empty. And on those moments especially, the fact that we know of a risen Saviour we take some comfort. But I want to show you today that there's comfort now uh, from the risen Lord and Saviour for those of us who know what it is to have fallen and to have failed, to be broken, to be downcast, uh, to know what it is in life to have come to an end of ourselves. There's a real message uh, from the grave. It's a message, you know, to the world of resurrection. It's a message, you see, of the church that there's restoration. There's a message to people personally. There's restitution. And what you find here in this little chapter of chapter 16, just got two little words for you. But I would like you just to think of this chapter because when you come and you go through it, there are so many messages that one could give. You have the account of the women who came on that first day, very early in the morning. And then you've got the account of the stone which was rolled away. And then uh, you have the news given uh, by this uh, figure, this young man clothed in uh, a long white robe sitting at the right side in verse 5. And then you have these words uh, from verse 6 of the news that he gave. Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. There's a message. He is not here. That's another message. See the place where they laid. That's another message. Go and tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said. And for us this morning, just two little words from that message of Christ being raised from the dead, which was given by the angel to then those women who came to the tomb. And in this version of the Bible, what you have here are these words which are separated from the other words. I'll read it to you from verse 7. But go and tell his disciples. And then there's a hyphen. Big pause. And Peter. 
big pause, that he's going before you into Galilee. And there you will see him as he said. And this morning, that very word for anyone personally here who, who needs to know that God is speaking and God has a message for you and that it is for you today as that was given to those women. Go and tell my disciples and Peter. And the reason why it is and Peter is because very simply this, that I believe Peter had come to a place, as you know the account, a broken man, a fallen man, a man who denied the Lord Jesus Christ, one who had come to an end of himself. He had fallen spiritually. He definitely had fallen emotionally. In the very word that we read in the Greek, that when the Lord actually looked at him, when he denied him and the rooster crowed, that even Peter even came uh, to the end of himself, fell to the ground. He was a broken man. They say the harder they are, the harder they fall, uh, the higher he was, the further than he fell. He was a man who knew what it was to be amongst these disciples. He had been with the Lord Jesus for over three years. He had been uh, one of the closest to him. But I assure you, when that news came from the tomb by the women, go and tell his disciples at that moment and that time, I'm sure Peter may have thought to himself, I'm no longer a disciple. I don't belong to that people. I've denied our Lord. I am no longer counted worthy or fit to be among them. And the Lord Jesus knows that. He knows the mind and the heart of the apostle Peter. And with that, you see, the Lord Jesus gives this word even now to the women. Go and tell uh, my disciples and Peter, because I assure you in ministry, I may have heard it a hundred times because of something that's taken place. Could you remove me from membership? Uh, don't count me as part of being a Christian. Those days have gone. Our minds can be filled with such regret and sorrow and darkness. It, that must have been the mind of the Apostle Peter at this moment. You can think of not one positive thought. The one he had loved, the one he had been with, had been taken and crucified and, and, and killed upon that tree. All hopes, and he was there when it took place. And he did nothing at all but forsake him and deny him. Now you who are here today who have gone through perhaps great sorrowing times, you may have uh, been with your loved one and they have passed into glory. And you know, at those times of, of death, even when we have been there and we have done our best, we have held the person's hand, said the right things. The moment that death comes in on the most peaceful deathbed, on that moment, regrets and sorrows and things come to your mind that you wish you would have done. When death comes, it always brings its friends. It's always the fear, always the shock, always the regret, always the guilt. And now you see, but Peter was there. And, and he could have done something. But it was different for him. He's the one who denied him and forsook him. Said he never knew him. And the Lord Jesus Christ was taken and brutally killed upon that cross. When death comes, you see, all hopes which we had, then they have gone and they've passed. I know a number of years ago, there was a little situation where there were a group of uh, just, I say, young people, but they were in their 50s, and there'd been a fallout, a fallout amongst them, a big, big fallout. And what happens is this, is that on that fallout, one of them who tragically died a number of weeks after. I remember then speaking to one of them. They'd been friends nearly all their lives. 
the great regret because it could never be repaired. It could never be mended. Never those words once again to be brought. Peter knew of all this and although it's the resurrection and the news is great for each and every one of you. It's the greatest news. Death has been conquered. The sacrifice has been accepted. Your sin has been taken away. But I'll tell you when Peter hears that, it's not for him. It's not for him. Tell my disciples. And then those words, and Peter, and Peter. And I could come here and preach perhaps to you today and tell you the wonderful news of the gospel that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And someone says, but not me, not me. It may be for the world, but not me. And you know, when you read this account, what those words must have meant, you see, uh, for the Apostle Peter. Jesus knew the place he was in. Jesus had warned him, Satan has desired to have you and to shift you as wheat. And now you see Peter as he fell and denied and with the regrets and sorrows of all that he's done, the place he was, the position he had, the light which was shown, the things he didn't do, the devil knows what it is to hold someone in that very grip. And what's interesting, when you read Mark's account, as you know this morning, you know, Mark's account is, we believe, the reflections and from Peter that Peter tells us in 2 Peter. He wanted to write those things which happened. And in this account, you find certain things which are not recorded in some of the Gospels. So, for example, when Peter was on the lake and the Lord Jesus walked upon the water and, uh, you know, Peter sees the Lord and he gets out to the boat and he actually walks on water. Uh, it's not recorded in Mark. He skips that bit. He doesn't put it in. And then you've got the great confession that the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Peter made of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you are the son of God. And you know what happens after, don't you? Uh, Peter immediately then tells him, you should not go to Calvary. And then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Well, Peter records those words. He records those words. I, I just wonder that when he was relaying that whole account to Mark of what happened on that day, how the women came back with the news that the tomb was empty, the stone was rolled away, and then in those words, and go and tell his disciples. I just wonder if Peter paused for a moment and said to Mark, and Peter, he said, and me. I, I don't know if you've you've ever had the experience of someone asking for you. Someone wants you. Perhaps if you were in school and then there's a knock on the door and someone says, comes in, the headmaster wants you. You're full of fear, aren't you? <laughs> full of fear. But then you've got another time. Perhaps there is someone who has been close and you've been friends and perhaps they're on the deathbed. And the phone call comes and you, they've asked for you. I don't know how you feel. Perhaps you've had that experience. Someone now wants to see you before they leave this world. Well, all you think about at that time, you don't think how wonderful you are, how great you are. But you are amazed that they could even ask for you. I tell you, if you've had that experience, you can times it 10,000 that Jesus Christ has asked for you and he wants you and he says and you and you and you think to yourself and me I want to tell you that the very message that Jesus Christ has risen again was very personal for Peter that day it was the words 
of restitution. That even now he who had put himself outside of being perhaps part of the people of God, there are these words of confirmation. But I want to share with you also, because they are quite incredible, they're words for us as a church, corporately. Corporately. Because everything is instructive uh, for us in what we are to be as Christians and as a church. Now, it's been well documented uh, about the women who are found here at the tomb. You know the saying, they were last at the cross and they were first at the grave. And it was to the women that were given the message to tell the news to the disciples that Jesus Christ has risen again from the dead. But in doing that, there is great instruction for us because they needed it also. Go and tell his disciples and Peter, and that's important, because I assure you, as a church this morning, if there's a message that we need to hear as a church and learn to minister and to give as God has shown us, it's the message of restoration to fallen brothers and fallen sisters. Do you know, when you think of the church and its great work, we've got a great concern, don't we, for the lost which are out there. We do our evangelism, we're on our open air, we do our great work, but you know, there are lost people in this place today. There are those which are broken. There are those which are among the very people of God who know what it is now not to be part of the very people of God. Something has taken place. And what is being taught us is that there is that restoration. The church has to know that. Tell my disciples, and by the way, in case you forget, and Peter, the one on the bed, the one curled up in the corner, the one now, you know, totally broken, hiding in that room with you. And it needed to be said. And I'll tell you why it needed to be said. Because um, of all the fun that church life can be, when you read the account of uh, these, these disciples... They were just like, look, it is as ordinary as it is in any other society and community and group. When you read this account, you know, what do you find? You find only before he was going to Calvary. They were fighting amongst each other. That's what they were doing when Jesus was there with them. They were arguing about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. That's what they were up to as they were making their way to now the, you know, the Last Supper. Their great concern was not about others or about their brothers and sisters, it was about jockeying for position. It was about who was number one. And when the others found out about it, they were all now upset because they all wanted, we're told, all wanted. Do you know, it is as human as could be. When you think what we must have been great being with those 12, have you not read the book? They fell out. They argued. Two, one was called... Well, they were brothers called Thunder. They were people who didn't get it. They were slow learning. And even when the Lord Jesus Christ was with them, they were pointing the finger. Can you imagine what it must have been like in that upper room, hiding away, scared, filled with fear, everything lost? I tell you, Sniffing of the blood, the weakness of a moment, there would have been fingers pointed. There would have been accusations given. There would have been protests of, you weren't there. 
and look what you did and where were you and what about that and you knew what you said and where are you now I tell you that must have been one bad and awful room in those moments when the Lord Jesus Christ had gone to Calvary and died and before that Sabbath morning and yet you see that's what we need to learn is it not the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on earth and before he went he had to teach them and one of the lessons he had to teach them was this is that he he knelt down and washed the feet of the disciples <laughs> and of course when he was doing that it, it wasn't just because he was showing us how humble he was but he was actually showing us of what he was going to do for us at Calvary. He was going to wash us and make us clean. And he was taking the lowest position. And he was going to come and he was going to deal. And when Peter says, you're not going to wash my feet. And he says, unless I, I wash you, you have no part in me. But he was showing us that he was going to go and forgive us our sins and cleanse us our sins. But he was also going to show us too. You say, do you do any foot washing in Libanus? He said, we haven't done foot washing since we left some church years ago. I never heard of foot washing. But there's a place for it. I tell you what it is. It's the forgiveness. Forgiving one another and when you do that to one another as the Lord has shown us and in the scriptures and the New Testament he tells them he says it's a message now that brother which has fallen you restore him with a spirit of gentleness forgiving one another bearing one another's burdens looking after one another taking care of one another that's the story he says now here this morning to the women go and tell my disciples don't forget Peter you go and see him he needs it more than others you go and speak to him don't shun him don't bypass him when you tell the news when he's there in that corner you go to him personally and Peter, he asked for you. You, Peter. He really did. And it's great news, isn't it? But it's news also, as you say, which is to be given now to the whole world. To the whole world. You find it here in verse 7. Uh, that he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him, as he said to you. Now the third thing about this news which was given. And just in case anybody thinks for a moment. I went to, um, I went to church this morning. And you say what did, the, what did that speaker tell us about from Naboth? Oh you should, have, you should have heard it. He told us I tell you what I got out of it. Everybody needs a second chance. Don't write anybody off. That's what it was. Well, if you think that, you've got it wrong. You've got it absolutely, totally wrong. The Bible tells us, and he puts it this way, no one deserves no second chance. No second chance. The reality is, we deserve hell, judgment, and the wrath of God. That's the reality. It's not that there's something about us that could possibly in some way in our natural condition be redeemable. But it's got better news than that. It's not, you see, just have a second chance. The news which you've got to come to the world is this. You go before into Galilee and there you will see me. Because the news that we've got, you see, in Jesus Christ is this. Although we didn't deserve to have a second chance, or a third chance, or a fourth chance. But
but in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is now that the eternal, the great, the one, the true, the living God who came to this earth was born of a virgin, took on human flesh, that that body in which he lived, who became a real human being with a real soul and with uh, yet two natures, he lives and he dies and he does this. He does it to redeem a lost humanity. No, he has come to this world to restore that which was broken, to bring back that which was soiled with sin because that's what he's done because he's come and taken of our nature. Let me put it like this to you. When God made us as human beings, you know how he made us. I know you don't think of it like this. You looked in the mirror this morning and you looked and you thought, oh, not doing too bad. I know I'm uh, 70 <laughs> or 80. I'm still got, you know, some... Do you know how he made you? He took you from the dust. He took you from the things that you wiped from your windowsill. He took you from that very dust of the earth. And you know what he did? He took on dust himself. Because dust he's come to redeem. And dust he's come to reserve. And dust he's come to bring back to himself. Now here's the news. It's the news for the world. No, the world. He is going before you into Galilee. That's where you're from. That's where you live. That's where you work. That's where you eat. That's where you sleep. That's where your family is. That's where your friends are. That's where you have come from. It's in to Galilee he's going. Tell them I'm coming before them. Now, very interesting about Galilee, just in think you think I'm making it up. There's a prophecy about Galilee, and this has got to be it, isn't it? I mean, you find it here in Isaiah chapter 9. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. Well, who's that? It's Galilee. Those which were counted as nothing as lightly esteemed. It's the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. Though that land which was heavily oppressed beyond the Jordan. That land where people walked in darkness. That land, that land has seen a, a great light. Those who sat in the shadow of death. Jesus comes. The prophecy is fulfilled. You tell them, go to Galilee, to those who are sitting in darkness, to those who are oppressed, those who have no light. Go to Galilee, those people who are counted as nothing. The resurrection's great news. Great news for this world, wonderful news. It's news, you see, which restores all things, people's lives, people's hopes, restores us with that light which we desperately need. I don't know if you've ever, you must have, I mean, it's one of these kind of, of things that people read these days. Um, I never read them myself. I always watch the films. But you know of C.S. Lewis' Narnia Tales and, and um, all I can remember of the lion and the witch in the wardrobe is that it was always winter in Narnia. Always winter. And then you see it was, it was winter until when? And, until the great lion Aslam who comes to a point where he, he has to lay down his life. In that land of Narnia is the moral law and it's held by the moral law and the moral law needs to be kept and Aslam puts himself on that altar as you know the story. Aslam rises from the dead as Aslam rises from the dead, the snow begins to recede. The sun begins to shine. Nature begins to return. The land begins to be restored. Now, now listen. 
This is the great news. Now go and tell my disciples. And Peter, don't forget him. I'm going into Galilee. Going into Galilee. It's news for this world. You see, when, when God made the world, this is how he did it. It says that he made the, the creation order, the, the, the material, the lights in the sky, the sea, the earth. And then after that, he made the, the trees and the vegetation. After that, he made the, the animals and the, the fowls of the air and the fish of the, of the sea. After that, he made then male and female. He did that. And then he rested. Oh, but our Lord Jesus Christ has done something. He rose again on the first day of the week. He rose again on the eighth day. He's risen again to that new creation and that new dawn and that whole now world which he came to make. He's restoring. But it's this way. It starts with his people. Starts with those he's come to call to himself. And the scriptures tell us that this created order is groaning and waiting for the day of the redemption of the sons of God. Oh, I'm a great one for the environment. And you say, how is it going to happen? It gets when people get converted. <laughs> when they get converted and your lives begin to change and God restores, you see, once again, he's got a great plan for this world and he's going to restore all things he came and took upon himself the dust of the earth now go and tell that to the world and go and share that news even this day look restoration is definitely a message of the resurrection you need to know that in your life and we need to know it as a church we need to know it in this world in which we live. When the Lord Jesus is going to ascend into heaven, they ask the question, when will you restore the kingdom? When the apostle Peter healed a man who was lame, he then preached a sermon, and he says this is just a sign for the restoration of all things. It's what he looked for. It's what he looked for. And you know, there's a message just two words. That's, that's all they are. Shall I give you those two words? You know, these are the two words for you this morning. Very simple. And you. And you. And you. No. And you. And you say, not me. And you. You say, I'm a sinner. And you. You say, I'm backslidden. And you. You say, I am wrong, and you. It's, and you. Wonderful news of what he's done. Let's close then with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful this day for the mighty, the great, and the glorious news of the rising again, the resurrection of our Lord and our Saviour, your only begotten Son. And because, Father, of that this day, we know that you have given us hope and light, and you have given us this day, even here, that message that wherever we've been, and whatever we may have done, and the failings that we have made, Lord, we're thankful for the good news of the gospel, that you have news for us personally, news to share as a church, news, O oh Lord, for this world in, in which we live. O oh, gracious God, please help us this day, we pray. And please will it be now that as we go from this place, would you touch each and every one of us with that glorious message that you have called us to yourself. You have uh, something, Lord, that you have not finished with us and that you have given us that hope. 
may it be for those which are downcast and sorrowing may it be that word of life we ask you in jesus name amen